Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's Top 10 Favorite TV Shows of 2019. This video is a part of a series of videos I do every year where I count down my top 10 favorite shows or seasons of shows that aired in the year that passed, in this case of course 2019. So I, I believe this is the fifth or maybe fourth year in a row that I'm doing this where I'm counting down my favorite shows. Now, uh, first I'll throw out the uh, standard rules of what shows are eligible, what seasons are not. Basically, if the season finished airing in 2019, then it counts as a season, uh, a show of 2019. Uh, even if it started in 2018, uh, that's fine as long as it's finished its run in 2019. However, if it started in 2019 and haven't finished yet, then that does not count. That will be considered a 2020 show. Uh, some examples of this are Rick and Morty, which only aired five episodes. The rest of the season has yet to air. Or Bojack Horseman, which only aired the first half of the season. The second half of the season is coming out in January, which means it's going to count as a 2020 show. Uh, and of course Vikings season 5 counts because it ended in uh, 2019 but season 6 does not count because that just started in 2019 and it's continuing onward to 2020. That sort of thing. Uh, anyway, any who, any how, uh, it's, this is an interesting list this year because I think this is the first time I've been doing this that none of the shows on my list I did I give a rating of 10 out of 10. Uh, I think it's the first time it happened. Although the top three, or at least the top two, were very, very, very close to getting a 10. They were like, ooh, so close to getting 10s. Uh, but not, not quite. Uh, but that being said, the lowest uh, show, even in my honorable mention, is an 8. Now, usually I have some 7s in there. So, yeah, so that's strange. Even though there's not as... So it's not a big of a spectrum. Usually it goes from 7 to 10, but here it's just 8s and 9s. Uh, so make of that what you will. But anyway, um, before I get into my top 10 favorite shows of 2019, first I'll start with my top 3 most disappointing shows of 2019. Now, as I said, this is something I do every year. I don't do a worse list because if a show's bad, I don't watch it. But there are some shows that do not live up to the potential of previous seasons, and they have uh, their latest season was quite a disappointment and a downgrade compared to what the show used to do or could do. So, starting, let me start with my number three most disappointing show of 2019, and I know. This is probably a bad way to start the video. This is going to rough some feathers up and piss some people off right at the start. Which I'm sorry, but hey, that's the way it goes. And if you've seen my channel and you've seen my sh uh, reviews on this show, you know I already feel this way. My number three most disappointing show of 2019 is The Orville Season 2. Now, I am an oddball, I know, because most people liked Season 2 of The Orville better than Season 1. I did not. Uh, I preferred Season 1 uh, because... Part of the reason is a lot of people like to oh, is less fart jokes and less comedy. But here's the thing: I only liked the show because of it was because of the comedy, because it was a satire that parodied Star Trek. If you take that away, which the season did a bit too much, then it is a subpar sci-fi show that's ripping off Star Trek, not a comedy that's parodying Star Trek, and that's a very distinct difference for me. And in this case. This show, which I admit is a good show, and I'll probably keep watching it because it has some good writing and has interesting characters, but a lot of times the show zigged when it should have zagged this season, where it set up interesting, unique characters and interesting, unique stories, but instead of falling through with them, it decided to just copy Star Trek. And because there was no com or less comedy involved, it's less of a parody and more of we're just going to rip off what Star Trek already did, rather than going in this new direction. Case in point is this two-part everyone seemed crazy about, uh, where the, you know, I can't even, the K-Lon, I believe they're called, the androids, you know, invaded uh, the Union and tried to destroy Earth. Like, 
that's too, trying to be too hard like Best of Both Worlds. When it should have just went in its own direction. Like, they could have went in a very unique direction with a very different species. But no, let's just make them like a Borg. Let's just be like Star Trek. And at the end of the, had the season finale, that was just trying to be like Yesterday's Enterprise. Oh, let's just do Yesterday's Enterprise again instead of doing our own thing. And frankly, I think the show was much worse for it. I think it should have went in its own direction and it should have kept the comedy. My opinion. Anyway... I can hear the dislikes coming in as I speak. <laughs> Let me get to my number two, uh, second most disappointing show. And technically this is season one, but it's a reboot or continuation or whatever you want to call it. I'm talking about the Twilight Zone. Uh, I guess I'd call it season one because this new Twilight Zone with Jordan Peele, which, you know, visionary director, uh, Oscar-nominated director who uh, has filmed... Uh, Get Out got nominated. I hadn't seen his newest film, Us, yet, but I heard that was very good. So I was expecting big things out of this. Now, and it's funny because my brother heard of it. They're like, oh, he, they're doing another Twilight Zone? Jeez. But I was like, no, no, but this one's different. You don't understand, man. They got Jordan Peele. They got a bunch of a new f uh, fresh blood, so they're going to reinvigorate the, the, the show because... If you're not aware, the show was redone in the 80s. George R.R. R. Martin was actually a writer on that show. And uh, then it was redone in the early 2000s. A lot of people may not remember this to be aware of this, but for a year or two, I think it was just one year, maybe two, it aired on UPN right after Star Trek Enterprise in the early 2000s and Forrest Whitaker was the host <laughs> and that version of it sucked it's like so it kept getting progressively worse and so I was like no no, no. this time it's going to be great it wasn't it, it was the stories were horrible like there was one or two episodes I thought yeah they're okay but the rest of the episodes I thought were dog shit <laughs> and they were just like trying to rip and like that series season finale where they were trying to pay tribute to the original was just awful it was like i couldn't even stand to watch it and you know me i'm i'm very left-leaning i love political commentary in my shows like i love star trek because of that because it has a lot of uh, left-leaning political commentary which i really love but there's a good way to do it, and there's a bad way to do it. A good way to do it is by servicing, making it fit into the story and service the story, make it blend and seem powerful. Bad way to do it is the way the Twilight Zone does it, where it doesn't give a fuck about the story, just wants to knock you over the head with this political commentary, which, in most cases, I very much agreed with. But <laughs> it made for bad storytelling. So... That was the second most disappointing show of the year. Now, my number one most disappointing show of 2019, if you have any familiarity with my channel whatsoever, you should be able to guess this. Uh, and I might go as far. Not only is this the most disappointing season of television of 2019, I might even go as far as to say this is the single most disappointing season of television ever of all time. I am, of course, talking about Game of Thrones Season 8, the final season of Game of Thrones. This show that I used to love. I built my whole channel off of this show. Now I don't even want to talk about this show anymore. I never, at the moment, maybe I'll get over this in a few years, but at the moment, I don't want to mention this show. I don't want to watch more episodes of it, even in the earlier seasons, which were still great. Because this... This season was so massively bad. It so failed to live up to how great the show is in an extraordinary way. Now, I know some people try to compare it to other final seasons which are disappointing like Dexter or Lost or what have you. But the thing with those, particularly Dexter and other shows like that, um, they didn't have as high of a legacy to follow. Like, Dexter's a good show, don't get me wrong, but it was never at the level of Game of Thrones. Like, Game of Thrones was huge, tons of different characters, great acting, like this huge, like, undertaking that even if you look at it as an adaptation, was a huge undertaking because these were books that many have seen as unadaptable. And the showrunners, Dan Dave, did the unthinkable. They did an unbelievably amazing job. In adapting this material and correcting it and, and, and putting their own spin on it when it was necessary. So they did an amazing job for six years. 
Now, <laughs> then they just lost it and just, they, they just gave up. It's like they didn't even try. They didn't even put any effort in. They just put out this bland, mediocre skeleton, bare bones skeleton of what the show used to be. Now, one argument I could make of why this is not so disappointing is because I saw this coming. Because of season seven was also really horrible, particularly the last three episodes, which were just as bad as any episode in this season. And so I already knew that the show had gone downhill, and I thought that the, the final season would likely follow suit, but I had a sliver of hope that maybe it would, and the first two episodes of the season eight were actually really good, so that's uh, fooled me into being even hope more hopeful that the season might, might actually be good, but then especially once we got when we got to episode four and especially episode five uh i knew that uh it was worse than season seven so this it was a total disaster it's not where the characters ended up that's a straw man it's how they got there it's how little character development how little effort was put like I don't mind have Daenerys go crazy and kill a bunch of people fine have Jamie go back to die with Cersei fine have a, you know uh, Jon Snow kill Daenerys and get arrested for it fine all of the, the conclusions of what happens to these characters is fine I think pretty much everyone agrees on this how it happened is the issue it was so inconsistent with the characters it was so underdeveloped it was so not done this may be one of the worst. Like, I've ranted against the final season of Lost. This is worse. This is worse. And it's so disappointing after how amazing the first six seasons were. So, Game of Thrones season eight, most disappointing season of 2019 and of all time. Anyway. <laughs> ha! All right. So now, let me be more positive and get into my top ten favorite shows of 2019 um but before i get to these uh there's a few shows that i think i should just get out of the way that are not on my list because i know some people were expecting them to be as a star trek fan someone who covers star trek people might expect to see star trek discovery season two which i was more positive than season one they might expect to see that on my list, but it is not. Uh, it is actually just one outside of the honorable mention. Uh, so I'm kind of mentioning it now. But just barely missed making the honorable mention. Uh, so I did like the season, but there were better shows this year. Uh, the Mandalorian wasn't even anywhere near <laughs> making my uh, list. Uh, I did like the show. It's not a bad season, but to me it was kind of me more mediocre. I think there was a, uh, definitely a lot better this year. I haven't even finished watching The Witcher, so I can't say where it would have landed, but I've kind of given up waiting for it because honestly I'm not interested. I don't like it after four episodes. Now here it gets better towards the end of the season, but it's a chore watching it. I don't want to watch it. I'm pretty sure even once I do watch it, it wouldn't make this list, but who knows. I don't see how the final episodes of the season could be that good. Uh, His Dark Materials, uh, another show I watched, I thought it was, again, it was, it was just okay. So that didn't make my list either. So anyway, Vikings, as I mentioned earlier, also didn't make my list. Uh, it was, again, it was close, but no cigar. So, uh, and anyway, Stranger Things Season 3, that was like not even in consideration, really. <laughs> it was nowhere near my list. So, anyway, let me start with a few honorable mentions that barely made my list. And by the way, I did see, I saw 25 shows this year. So this is top, well, 13. Well, top 10 and then 3 honorable mentions plus the 3 at the bottom out of 25 shows. So anyway, uh... First honorable mention I'll get to is Black Mirror Season 5. Uh, I, I enjoyed this. I love Black Mirror, but this season is admittedly one of their weaker seasons. It had two mediocre episodes and one good episode. Um, the one good episode is an episode most people didn't what thought was crap and hated, which I loved. It was the My, Miley Cyrus episode, which I actually thought was a great character story and had an interesting commentary on uh, pop culture and news technology in an interesting way. So that was actually my favorite episode. But the other two I thought were, they're just fine. Like the the Vipers ones with the video game, two men having an affair through the video game. Yeah, 
I mean, it was okay. I, I didn't see anything that special about it. The other one with the guy like taking someone hostage, just it didn't really add anything. It felt like Black Mirror fodder, like it was not really breaking any conventions. So it was a, like a spot. I loved the Myra Cyrus, which is why it made my uh, honorable mention. But uh, not good enough to make my top 10. Anyway, next honorable mention is Euphoria Season 1. This is an interesting uh, teenage show on uh, HBO. Now, if for those who complain that there was too much sex and nudity in Game of Thrones, that Game of Thrones was pretty much like a softcore porn, don't watch Euphoria. Euphoria, if you think Game of Thrones is a softcore porn, then you're going to think Euphoria is a hardcore porn. There's <laughs> a whole lot. But it's not. It, that's ridiculous. But I've I've never seen. I don't think there's any show ever I've seen that has that has much sex and nudity as you for it. But that is of course not why I made my honorable mentions. I just I don't let that interfere with my enjoyment of this show. A lot of people do because the show has very interesting characters. It tells a very uh, realistic uh, sort of edgy look at what high school life is and it reminded me a bit of 13 reasons why which is another show that i love but it's a lot more realistic and i dare say better uh it felt more real and visceral but it's also trying to be more edgy now the issues it would have landed high on my list but i had some issues because the ending it kind of went off kilter and it really pay off the storylines it was building all season and it ended with this like stupid musical number which i was just like what <laughs> so that final episode kind of brought it down to me and kept it out of my top 10 but still good season anyway next honorable mention is the end of the fucking world season two now, I love the end of the fucking world season one. It was actually an amazing season of television. But a lot of people thought that the show should have just ended there. That it should have been a self-contained one-off season. And I disagreed. I'm, I was like, no, I want to see more of these characters. I can think they can do more. And they did. And it was still good. But not nearly as good as the first season. It didn't quite live up to the freshness and originality of the first season, although it did introduce some new interesting characters and go in some new interesting directions. But the problem is is that the characters felt more whiny. Alyssa felt more like you didn't like her as much this season. You felt like she was being uh, totally rude to What's-His-Face the entire season, where last time What's-His-Face wanted to kill her, so you weren't sympathetic to him. So I don't think they did as good of a job, and plus they waited until the end of the season to actually put them together, which kind of annoyed me. So there's still a lot of positives, like the, the editing and the style of it was still great, but uh, uh, didn't quite live up to season one, in my opinion. Now, let me get into my top 10 favorite shows of 2019. And we'll start with my number 10, Mindhunter Season 2. Um, I think I prefer Season 1 of Mindhunter, but I wasn't, I didn't watch it till after it came out, so I couldn't include this in any of my previous lists. Uh, but I enjoyed Season 2 as well. It's a very, very slow burn, but it has very strong character stories, very strong acting, and of course it's one of the creepiest, realistic, uh, serial killer, you know, FBI agents hunting after serial killer shows, like, ever. Yeah, I mean, it's David Fincher. David Fincher is amazing and uh, does a great job with the show, so Mindhunter Season 2 is my number 10. My number nine is Russian Dolls, season one. I thought this was a really unique take on the uh, the time loop genre, and they sort of combined it with a more modern, uh, like, party girl type comedy show you'd expect to see on Net Netflix, but gave it a time loop spin, which I thought was quite original. Uh, I really liked the main character, uh, the actress. I don't know her name off the top of my head, but she was on Orange is the New Black. It was a great job and a centric character who you like to see more of. And it's in a time loop story. And the first time I heard about this, I was like, how are they going to keep, because I thought it was a movie at first, a Netflix movie, but then they're like, no, it's a show. I'm like, how are they going to keep a time loop story going on for an entire season of television? That sounds like it would get repetitive. And it doesn't. And I was so impressed that it didn't. Like, because sometimes there's even a single episode like the Star Trek one that a lot of people, the Next Generation one, 
I think is a bit overrated. I think that gets repetitive. But they managed to do a time loop story and keep it fresh and interesting throughout the entire season. So that's impressive. But the way the season ended was a bit sort of pretentious in my opinion. Again, kind of similar to Euphoria. It ended on like a musical number type dealie that didn't really explain what the hell was going on. So I want to see another season so they can actually explain what the hell. Because if that's all the season we get, I think I want to think that's a terrible ending. But still, great seasons are out. Uh, so, Russian Dolls Season 1. Next, we'll get into my number uh, 8, which is Hannah Season 1. Uh, this is a show on Amazon Prime. It was based off a novel. They had a movie a few years back, which wasn't very good. But the show was much better uh, about a uh, trained assassin. Sort of like, uh, almost like genetically enhanced or engineered by like a secret government agent but she ends up uh you know being raised separately from them because this guy who worked with the program defects and raises her as uh, her father and he's kind of a trained assassin and then the government of course discover her and they become on the run and they get separated and she ends up learning what it is to be a real teenage girl like meeting other teenage girls and having friendships but at the same time being this trained assassin killer and I think uh, the show did a way better job than that crappy movie. Uh, I think the characters were much better developed. You had that one dude who played Rick Flagg from Suicide Squad, uh, who was also in Alter, Alter, uh, Altered Carbon, who wasn't really that good in that show either. Um, do a really good job. He's actually a good actor. Who knew? I knew from watching this show. I was like, holy shit, he can actually act. And it was a really exciting, well-developed show. So Hannah, season one, is my number eight. So next we'll get into my number seven, which I had originally hoped would be higher on my list uh, because it's one of my favorite shows. Uh, Mr. Robot, season four. Um, now, I thought this season was off to a rough start, which is apparently different <laughs> from what most people started who thought it was a masterpiece from the beginning. I had some issues with the first five episodes, but then after that, it just, even within those five episodes, though, uh, except for that one with Tyrell, because that episode was a heap of pretentious shit, but other than that, the other first five episodes, even though I had issues with them, there were good things in them. There was still amazing acting, amazing editing, amazing moments, but after that, the show started to really explode the season and I was like holy shit this is great it's having some of the best episodes some of the best moments of the entire show and this is a show that I've loved like I still think season three is one of the best seasons of all time uh, and while I didn't think season four lived up to season three I thought it was starting to but then it had that ending which wasn't a terrible ending don't get me wrong it's not even in the same conversation as a Game of Thrones but it was a tad bit disappointing because of the potential. Like, this would be a decent ending for a decent okay show. But this wasn't a decent okay show. This was an amazing top-notch show. And as an amazing top-notch show, the ending didn't quite live up to that amazing top notchedness that I was expecting. So it's still top 10 material. It's still a lot better than a lot of the other shows I saw this year. But... Not quite as amazing as I was hoping it would be, Mr. Robot Season 4. Alright, so now we'll get to my number 6, uh, which is Dark Season 2. Now, Dark is another show that I just started watching this year. I had actually heard of it in Season 1. I had a couple commenters saying you should watch it. But I was confused. I thought it was like this weird horror thing. I was like, I don't want to watch that. But then I found out it was actually about time travel. I was like... Why didn't I watch this? So <laughs> I watched the first two seasons this year. I actually prefer season one, but I can't put that on the list because that came out several years ago. So I put on season two, which I still also really loved. Like it's number six on my list, so it's still really high. Uh, I thought they went into like the future and then they went into like a distant past. And I thought most of those things were kind of dull. Uh, so I thought it, it was slower than season one, but it did have some really amazing moments. And I can't understate how impressive the show is the way it uses time travel. It is convoluted, it's probably a good way to describe it, but if you can understand or believe this, I'm using the word convoluted in a good way. 
Uh, if that makes any sense to you. Because it's so intricate, might be a better word. It's so intricate. There's so many ins and outs. In fact, I don't completely understand it myself. Uh, but I like it. I, that shows me how complex this is. How really well thought out the whole show. Just how everything like falls into place. Because with time travel, it's easy for it to fall apart. It's easy for like Looper to be like, yeah, time travel doesn't make any sense. Just go with it. Dark doesn't do that. Dark makes complete and total sense. And it takes advantage of that. Like it sticks with this method of time travel, which is the, you can't change the past no matter how hard you try. So whatever happened, happened. And it really does some interesting things. You think, oh, that's a bit of limiting because you can't really change the timeline or anything like that. But it does fascinating things. And it has, like, because it's about an entire town, whereas it's not just one person who travels back in town. It's about people traveling back and forth between 33-year time limit periods. So it visits, like, you have the present, you got 1987, you got 1950-whatever, 53, 54, and then you had, and this season adds the future and the distant past. And, and so it's just fascinating the way they handle it. So was impressed with Dark. Uh, so this is my number six. Now we're getting to my number five, top five, fifth favorite show, uh, of the year, and uh, also going to stick with the theme of time travel. We'll go with my number five, Undone, uh, which was an animated series that aired on Amazon Prime. Uh, it reminded me a lot of uh, Russian Dolls, but I actually preferred this show because it also had that feel of a modern comedy that you would expect to find on a streaming service who the protagonist was a very quirky, eccentric uh modern woman and uh it was played i can't recall her name uh salazar i believe was last name she was in uh, lita battle angel apparently and she starred as the main character and i didn't realize like lita battle she was a totally different character than she was in lita battle angel because here she was very quirky and eccentric and like oh fuck it all and and i love this guy i fell in love with this character immediately i thought she was so well played but then they added in the element of trippy time travel they had fucking uh uh, Saul Goodman was, uh, you know, the actor who plays Saul Goodman played her dead father who appears to her and tells her that she has the ability to take herself out of time and they kept having scenes where she would be like knocked outside of time and she could experience different things at different rates and stuff like that and I just, I thought it was amazing and I love what they did uh, with this character and I just think it was, I was super impressed with what they did with this show. I was blown away. Now, the ending was a bit ambiguous, but I just dismiss it and be like, yeah. No. <laughs> it's not ambiguous. I know the true ending. And But I do think, again, similar to Russian Dolls, I think it would be hurt if this is the only season. I do hope they continue on. I think it would really improve the show if there's a season two. But I, regardless, I love this season. Uh, Undone season one. So next, uh, we'll get into my number four, sticking with Amazon Prime. Uh, we'll go with The Boys, season one. I did not even think I would like this show, let alone love it as much as I did. Now, this is a crazy off-the-walls show. And this is, well, because I'm not, I've never been that big into comic books and superheroes myself. So it's like, oh, another superhero show. And they were trying to make, oh no, this one's gritty and it's making fun. It's sort of putting down superheroes. And I was like, yeah, I kept thinking of the Watchmen movie, which I did not like. And I was like, yeah, I don't really want to see another gritty. This is like way better than that Watchmen movie. I gotta say. Uh, this is what I was hoping that Watchmen movie would be. This really takes risk, but it has something to say. Like it's, it's, it's the premise is that it's superheroes, what would they be like in reality, and how the corporate America would corrupt it, and how it would all be about making money. And it has a lot of commentary and things to say about how corporations corrupt, and uh, just uh, it, it speaks out against the Christian right as well. But then. 
I don't know, some of the humor in it I wasn't as big of a fan of, like having, you know, dolphin fly through the air or whatever. I don't know. But, like, there's a couple of characters I just didn't care about anymore by the end of season one. But, uh, it was, there were some powerful moments. I mean, this show was, you could say it was like a dark comedy. There was a lot of scenes that weren't me really meant to be taken full on seriously, and they were a bit over the top with how gruesome and, and, and silly they were. But there were some that were like, shh, like I'm thinking of one particular scene in the took place on an airplane that was one of the most powerful scenes. Like it really shook me to my core. Uh, so definitely a great show, uh, The Boys Season 1. Now, we'll get into my number three, uh, which is Chernobyl. And I'm just saying Chernobyl. Uh, because it's technically a miniseries. But I've always included limited series of miniseries. I had Maniac before uh, on my list. Uh, I, don't, I don't care if it's a, a miniseries. It's still a series of four different episodes. So, I mean, there's Black Mirror only had three episodes. So I kind of test. But although you could argue that season five where this is a standalone. But I don't care. It's in my list anyway. I thought it was a great show. I loved, uh, I loved Chernobyl. Uh, I was I didn't expect to like this show as much <laughs> as I did when I I didn't intend to watch this. My brother was like, "Oh, you should watch it. It's amazing." And I was like, "All right, well, it looks boring. It's another disaster movie. Whatever is HBO has the realistic documentary like disasters. It's gonna be so boring." <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> amazing acting completely blew me away. It really enticed me, grabbed you in the story. I love the risks it takes, too. Like, this main character, you know, Jared Harris. He appears in all the commercials. He's nominated for Oscars. He appears in, like, two minutes of the first episode. Which is, again, this is a two-hour episode, I believe. I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's only an hour episode. But still, he only appears in two minutes of the first episode. And then the show becomes about him. Because that made sense for the story. It made sense for the story to tell. And plus, I love the non-linear, the out-of-sequence way they told the story. It really, it put you in his mindset of, because you don't, they don't reveal what happened, what led up to the accident until the final episode, which I thought was an amazing method. Like, the, the whole, I mean, this is an interesting story by itself, but the way they told it, the way they chose to dispel events, and use the characters and get you invested, involved in these characters, and put you in the mindset of the people there. Absolutely amazing. So that's my number three, Chernobyl. All right, next we'll get into my top two. So I will say with these two shows, I was going back and forth. I almost like you can almost consider this a tie, really. I was going back and forth, like which one do I want to put higher in the other? I could not figure this shit out. Uh, but eventually I was like, all right, I'll put this at number two. So my number two is the Watchmen season one. And I'm calling that season one, hopefully, fingers crossed, <laughs> that there will be a season two. Because I really think there should be. But, I mean, that's the, what was the tiebreaker for me of why this was at number two and not number one was because of the ambiguous ending. Now, if there's a season two, there's nothing wrong with the ambiguous ending. Fine. If there's a season, if there is none and it's self-contained, then that's a bad way to end the show. I mean, they, I don't want to get too much into spoilers here, but they are hinting at this is what's going to happen so heavily, and they, they don't show it happen. They just, oh, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Bullshit. It did. Just show it to us. There's no reason not to show it to us. It's pretentious. But anyway, like, so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's horrible ruining the whole show. It's still my number two of the entire year. I'm saying that was the tiebreaker because it was stuck between this and another show. But this show, my God, <laughs> this is another, this is the, when I talked about other shows I didn't think would be that good, that is an understatement compared to this show. I wasn't even going to watch this show. I was like, The Watchmen, because I, as I mentioned, I didn't like that movie. It's like, I don't want to watch The Watchmen. I mean, Damon Lindelof is doing it. I love The Leftovers, one of my favorite shows of all time. Uh, so it was lost until its final season. <laughs> um, but it's like Damon Lindelof kept getting better and better. But I was like, yeah, but it's The Watchmen. Like, what can he really do? Can he really do anything with that? I'm not that interested in it. Yes, he can. And he, it was such an original spin, original take on, because really, 
I almost thought that his biggest flaw is they should have called it something else, like the Watchmen something, like, you know, Tulsa, the Watchmen, Tulsa, or, because it's not really the Watchmen. <laughs> it's a sequel spinoff. You know, Lindelof, I love him to death, as I said, he produces some of my favorite shows of all time, but he is pretentious. And he's like, ooh, it's like a remix. It's not a fucking remix, you pretentious hack. It's it's a fucking spinoff sequel. And they should call it something different. But that's neither here nor there. I love this fucking show. And he's not a hack, by the way. He's amazing. Like, every show he does, I love. But anyway, uh, he is pretentious, though. But... Um, yeah, god damn it, this show was so good. I was, I continued week to week to be, uh, why is this show so good? How is this happening? What's going on? It, like, destroyed my whole worldview. It's like, this show has no business to be as good as it is. But every week, particularly starting with episode three, they introduce a new character, focus on this character, to really develop a really interesting character, to do interesting things with them, take them in interesting ways. They've played with linear time. They show you different... Uh, things out of sequence that really had put you in the mindset of the characters. They make resolution. Unlike Lindelof previous shows, they pretty much explain all the weird shit. Well, except for Lube Man. You gotta, you gotta appreciate Lube Man. But other than that, that wasn't really important. All the important things that you're like, this is weird. What the fuck is going on? They explain it by the end of the show. And they don't just half-assedly explain it like they did in the end of Lost. Oh, these are whispers for dead people. No, they really explain it, and they fit it into the story and make it meaningful and make it make sense and explain it in a powerful way where you're like, oh, shit! This is what they were doing all along. Holy shit, this all makes perfect sense. It's amazing storytelling. And I maintain that Dr. Manhattan is one of the hardest characters to write for. Probably, like, I'll talk about the Superman problem. Dr. Manhattan is actually way worse than the Superman problem because he is so powerful, he knows everything exists in every time at once. How the fuck can you write for a character like this? Lindelof figured out how and, and used it in amazing ways, which I could not believe. So anyway, <laughs> Watchmen Season 1, very close to being my number one. This barely made it, but it's my number two. Anyway, we'll get to the show that is my number one. And if you are a fan of this channel, it should become as no surprise to you. The Expanse Season 4. I made no secret of saying The Expanse is my favorite show currently airing. Uh, has been for a while. Even though I had my issues with Season 3, Season 3 was like, I think, number 4 or 5 on my list last year. Uh... So much as I love The Expanse, I thought Season 3, yeah, had pacing issues. Season 4 did not. Season 4 was perfectly paced. Now, it didn't, like, blow my socks off the way Season 3 did at, the, at certain moments, but it had that consistency of quality. It had those character stories that improved upon the novels by, like, opening up, bringing in other characters we didn't see, so we're not just focused on this alien planet the entire time. We see uh, Bobby Draper... Back on Mars, we see Alva Sorella running for election back on Earth. And at the same time, uh, they really explore these new characters in interesting ways and do good things with them. They had this amazing villain with uh, Bern Gorman playing Murtry. He does such a great job. And, and, and they do such a better job of fleshing out the demonic characters that were never fleshed out in the book, like Naomi and Alex and, and Amos. Like, Amos, everyone loved him. And he was, like, taunting, uh, f fucking taunting Murtry. Mur Murtry's like, one day we're gonna end up bloody. And it's like, oh, how about now? I'm free now. Like, he's awesome. Everybody loves Amos. And everybody loves Holden, who was such a great, conflicted pr protagonist who maybe would fuck up from, from time to time, which makes him human, which makes him relatable, which makes him interesting. And so this, so this is one of the better seasons. And I've said before, my channel is split on which season I thought was better, season three or four. I think now officially I am going to say season four was better. Uh, so it was probably my second favorite season of the entire show behind season two, which can't nothing can live up to that so far. But <laughs> still absolutely amazing season and I goddamn stand by my stance that this is the best show currently airing on television. Anyway, that is it 
for my top 10 favorite shows of 2019. Thank you so much for watching. I will be back later this week with my top 10 favorite shows of the decade. Ooh. And yes, I know the decade doesn't really start till 2021, but pff, get out of here, nerd. I'm kind of here for 2010 to 2019. Deal with it. But anyway, <laughs> that will be coming later in the week. And of course, for the rest of the few months, I'll be covering my number one favorite show, as I stated, The Expanse Season 4, with a series of reviews and book to share comparisons. So be sure to check that out. Also, check out my channel for many more uh, videos and other shows like Star Trek and more. Uh, so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.